Hey everybody, welcome back to another round of physics and yeah, let's get going. We'll discuss today Kirchhoff's laws and also how to apply Kirchhoff's laws to analyze a circuit. But I thought it might be insightful to first of all treat a problem using our rules for combining resistors just to get a sense of why sometimes Kirchhoff's laws is uh, a faster, a more economical, a more beneficial approach than just combining resistors and capacitors. Now I've set up a simple circuit here, but uh, hopefully this will be demonstrative without adding too much complexity. And we'll go ahead, let's say one ohm and two ohms here, and that's perfectly fine. Now imagine for a second, if I asked you to find the current being provided by the battery, so maybe I'll label that I battery, that might be an appropriate, uh, the appropriate approach to this problem would probably be to combine resistors. Now you say, wait a minute, are these resistors in series or in parallel? You say in parallel, you notice that we have a node or a junction here. We have a second node or junction here. And so these two branches represent two different paths between those nodes. And therefore, we would say that these two are in parallel. And the next one is that we say, well, how do we combine resistors in parallel? Yeah, and you say, okay, well, the equivalent resistance is simply equal to the two resistors added in inverse. And so we get something that says this is three halves or that the equivalent resistance is two thirds. So there's our first step. Now, of course, what that means is that we are now modeling the circuit as simply being a single battery with the equivalent resistor. And then after reaching that point, we can simply apply Ohm's law to find the current coming from the battery. So we say Ohm's law is the potential drop across the resistor is equal to the current flowing through the resistor times the resistance of the resistor. So I've written it here specifically for this problem. And then we say, well, the current from the current flowing through the resistor is also the current coming through the battery. And so at the end of the day, we get something like the current is equal to the nine volt battery divided by two thirds. Now, yeah, you can go ahead and go through, but uh, let's see, nine times three is 27. So this would be like 13.5 amps would be the current being supplied by the battery. Now that I anticipate being a review for you. Now the next question, however, what happens if I'm asked not only to find the current coming from the battery, but also the current flowing through each of the individual resistors. In other words, I want specifically this current, I'll call that I1, and I want to know this current, I2. Now using this combination process, we got rid of I1 and I2. Right? That's, that was the whole point of doing the equivalent resistor. And so in that process of combining resistors, we have turned the problem into something that allows us to find some you know, currents easily, namely the one coming from the battery, but has obscured the currents flowing through the individual resistors. So there's two ways that we could go about that. Okay. One of them using the combined resistor approach is that we have to come back and say, when, what two things are the, excuse me, what thing is the same with respect to those two resistors? Thinking about those nodes and thinking about the fact that they're in parallel, 
we can say that the potential drop across the equivalent resistor, what I'll call VEQ, that must be the same as the potential drop across the first resistor. And because the first resistor is in parallel with the second resistor, those potential drops all must be the same, which incidentally, of course, is the potential drop across the battery. We can use this idea that the potential drop across each of the resistors is the same to then sort of unpack mentally the circuit again. And so then we can simply say, well, the drop across R2 must be equal to the battery. So thinking about R2 as our system for a moment, we can say, again, applying Ohm's law, the current flowing through R2 times the value of R2 is equal to the potential drop across that resistor. But in this case, that's just simply the battery. And we can go ahead and substitute in the numbers, right? Nine divided by two, and that gives us the 4.5 amps. You could do the similar same thing for R1. And I think you'll very quickly see that the current flowing through the first resistor is gonna be nine amps. And you notice that automatically, four and a half plus the nine gives us the 13.5 amps that we saw coming from the battery in the first place. Okay, good. Now that's for a simple circuit, okay. but we could make it more complicated. Imagine for a moment if we had not only two resistors in series, or excuse me, in parallel, but maybe we do something like this where we have a battery and two resistors, and then maybe we have another resistor, and then maybe we do another two resistors. Now I imagine that taking the combination of those, finding the equivalent resistance, and then you know, finding the current coming from the battery, you can probably see that that's gonna be perfectly fine, right? Two in parallel, and then we have three in series, and we go at it. But then when we go back to unpack, if we say, hey, wait a minute, we want the individual currents flowing through these branches, you can imagine that that unpacking process is gonna take a lot longer. Now, there is a faster way to do it, and the faster way is applying what we call Kirchhoff's Laws. Let me go ahead and give you Kirchhoff's Laws. We'll do a quick example, and then uh, probably other lecture videos will have you know additional examples uh, for more complicated stuff. So, so Kirchhoff's Laws. Uh, first of all, Please bear in mind that Kirchhoff's laws are based off of two kind of very fundamental ideas that we have in physics. One of them is what I would call charge conservation. Right? So, so the idea that you can't create or destroy charges, but rather that they get shifted or transferred around. The analogy that I use for this is something like a hose. And you know that if I put water into one side of the hose, it comes out the other. Okay. Here you have a split, but still the same thing that we can say is that the water going in must be equal to the water coming out. Okay. Kirchhoff's law says the same thing. This is sometimes referred to as the current rule. Sometimes it's referred to as the junction rule depending on your textbook. And sometimes I will abbreviate it as simply KCL, Kirchhoff's Current Law. That notation I don't believe is standardized. However, that is what the book in future classes will use. So it's always good to be familiar with that language. Current's, Kirchhoff's Current Law says the exact same thing, except rather than dealing with water, we deal with charge. So what we say is that the current going into a junction or the current going into a node must be equal to the current coming out 
of that node. That should make some sense. If it were not the case, then somehow you're building up excess charge right here, right? Like, like the charge is being removed from the circuit somehow, right? siphoned off magically though. And in general, if you have more than two, we would say that the, again, the current going in, and you could have the sum of the current going in equals the sum of the current going out. Okay. Second one. The second one is also known as either the loop rule or the, uh, let's see, voltage law. Now, of course, when we say voltage, what we really mean here is electric potential. But for either laziness or historical reasons, we say the voltage law and the abbreviation Kirchhoff's voltage law. So you have KVL, you'll have KCL. And the voltage law simply says this. Imagine for a moment that I have a charged particle. This is the charged particle, that's my system. Okay. And I have some surroundings. Here I've drawn the equipotential lines due to a positive and negative, otherwise known as a dipole. And this, the question is this. If my system starts on this equipotential, arbitrarily chosen, and it goes ahead and it moves around and it ends up at the exact same location. What's the change in electric potential? Yeah, survey says, well, if you start and end at the same location, your change in electric potential is zero. Good. And because the change in electric potential of our system is zero, the change in potential energy, the amount of potential, the difference in potential energy from the starting location and the ending location is zero. So what we mean by this is that energy is conserved. I have not gained nor lost energy as the particle, as my system travels around through space and then ends up at the same spot again. And please bear in mind, I'm talking about, you know, electric potential energy, because, of course, we're dealing with charges moving through a circuit. That, in a nutshell, is Kirchhoff's voltage law. It says that the change in potential is equal to zero as the particle moves around the circuit. Or, if you prefer, you could say that the jumps... So the increases in electric potential plus the decreases, sometimes referred to as drops, those two added together must be equal to zero. Or sometimes you'll see it written as V jump equals negative V drops. Or if you don't want to have to worry about the signs, right? Because jumps will be positive, drops will be negatives, and then you have negative negatives, okay? More often than not, people go ahead and take care of the jumps and drops a priori, go ahead and assign them during their analysis process, and then they'll just simply say that the jumps are equal to the drops. Okay. Uh, bearing in mind, I guess, the best way to say it is thinking about absolute values. Okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and return to our circuit and start getting a sense of how could I use Kirchhoff's laws to get a set of equations that when analyzed will solve the entire circuit. So, <clears throat> some, I don't want to reduce it down to some algorithmic process, but oftentimes it's really good to kind of run through this checklist to make sure that you haven't done anything, like you haven't skipped anything. Okay? So number one, I say, first off, draw the circuit. 
Now, left unsaid in some of my videos, although I've sort of implied it in the lecture sessions, is that when we draw a wire on a circuit diagram, we will go ahead and assume that the wire is perfect. In other words, it is an equipotential and a zero resistance wire. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Perfect wires have zero resistance and therefore perfect wires represent equipotentials within our circuit. Okay. Now why that's important is you can redraw a circuit to your heart's content so long as you preserve the electrical connections between components. Maybe more specifically, what I mean by preserving the electrical connections is that you don't accidentally take a resistor and when you redraw your circuit, perhaps the resistor is in parallel and you accidentally redraw it in series. Okay. That should make some intuitive sense. So elements that are in parallel in one circuit, as long as you draw them in parallel in the other circuit, they are 100% equivalent, they're 100% synonymous, and the only difference is visually how they look. And in fact, I think that this is probably one of the hardest parts when you get into labs dealing with circuits is recognizing that the schematic that you've drawn doesn't necessarily have to match visually what you see on the board. Okay? It's not like a resistor has to be going vertically on your schematic and it must be going vertically on the board. Okay, oh nay nay. So long as it has the same electrical connections, the physical orientation in space is irrelevant. So draw the circuit in a manner that makes the most sense to you. The next thing that we'll do is we will go ahead and guess directions for the currents. Now, you might say, wait a minute, Greg, I don't like this. How would I know which way the currents are going? And the key here is that when you do that, you simply make sure that you stay consistent the whole way through. Okay. Of course, we all like guessing correctly the first time. And for a circuit like this, it might be fairly straightforward to make good guesses, make guesses that end up being correct at the end. However, if you just simply be consistent with your choice, then the mathematics at the very end will tell you whether you have been correct in your initial assumption or if you were incorrect in your initial assumption. The key point here, however, is that you will still get the same answer. You will still get the same value. The only difference being that you'll have a negative sign in front of the current. A negative current simply means that your initial assumption on the direction was incorrect and it's going the opposite way. So, so long as you stay consistent the entire way through the process, the end answer will be correct in magnitude and you will mentally know that, oh, I simply chose the wrong direction to begin with, okay? So for this case, an example, we will go ahead and draw in three currents. Now, I have to admit that generally my, how I generally do it is that the current coming from the battery, I tend to label I naught or I battery. And then I tend to label currents as I go through the, resist the network. I usually match the label of the current with the resistor value. So I had one ohm and two ohms here. So I tend to do it that way, that's just me personally. Or the other way is that if I have a label for the resistor, I will make sure that the subscript for the current matches the subscript of the resistor. Okay. That's just me so that I mentally kind of keep in mind which currents go with which resistors. You are more than welcome to do your own kind of convention, but choose something that makes sense to you and try to develop a consistency with it. So the next thing I do, you have now committed to current directions. The next thing is what I like to say is label the jumps and the drops. Okay, so I'll say label jumps and drops. 
And when I say jumps and drops, what I'm really referring to is the electric potential. Okay. So for example, a battery is automatically to tells us what's the jumps and the drop, right? The short line represents the low side. So I'll go ahead and put a negative there and uh, the high side is a positive. Okay. Now again, please remember, we're referring to negative meaning low electric potential, positive meaning high electric potential. I'm lazy and I don't wanna to have to write low, 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 low all over the place. I don't wanna to have to write high, 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 high. So I'll just use plus and minus, okay? But please bear in mind that does not refer to charge, that refers to the potential for this situation. Okay, now we'll keep going. And the battery is, you know, we know which side is the high and the low side automatically. For the resistors, what we will do is the direction of the current will be used to determine the high and the low side. What I mean by that is current will flow through a resistor from the high potential side to the low potential side. I think of resistors as being kind of like a water wheel and water goes from a high elevation to a low elevation and it passes through the water wheel. So, based on our initially assumed directions for the current, we can now say this must be at a high potential and that's at a low potential. Similarly, this is at a high potential and that's at a low potential. And I encourage you, this is like the free body diagram for Newton's laws, right? Draw the circuit, put in the direction of the current and label the high and low potential sides. Doing this will ensure that when we're writing out the equations, we won't make any kind of silly mistakes in terms of sign errors, for example. Okay. Now that we've done that, uh, I will go ahead and say, well, we should also count, count the number of unknowns. Now I'll admit that generally speaking, circuit problems all boil down to finding the current in the different branches of the circuit or finding the amount of stored charge on the capacitors at every location in the circuit. Okay. Once you do that, you have the circuit completely solved. Any question that I can ask you is going to boil down to what's the currents, what are the stored charges? Or alternatively, because we know that currents and stored charges are proportional to changes in potential, electric potential, across circuit elements. Knowing the charges and the currents is a synonymous with knowing the potential drops across all circuit elements. So it's always good to ask yourself, how many unknowns are there? Because the number of unknowns will dictate the number of equations that we need to find, that we need to, to uh, write down and solve. One unknown requires one equation to solve. Two unknowns, two equations. 10 unknowns, 10 equations. Okay. Now, solving those equations might take a little bit of persistence but writing them down should be fairly, lack of a better term, straightforward. So once we have the number of unknowns, the next thing we'll do is that we're gonna apply Kirchhoff's laws to get the correct number of equations. Excuse me, I forgot to end there. KVL, I'll say KCL first, or in KVL. Okay. Now, my recommendation is to start off with KCL. And the reason for it is that the equations tend to be slightly more simple. By that, they don't contain the resistor values. Now, the important point about KCL, the current law, is that you cannot solve a circuit in its entirety just using KCL. Okay. And in fact, we will see that I notice I have, when I want to apply KCL, I need to go and look for the number of junctions. So take a minute, pause the video. How many junctions are in this circuit? Good, you see there's two. 
right? There's one junction here. I'll label that. I'll go ahead and label that junction A. And I have a second junction right here, junction B. But if you notice, looking at junction A and thinking about the current law, I have the current into that junction will equal the current coming out. So if I look at that, the current going in based on the direction I chose, that is I naught, the current coming from the battery. The current coming out, good, is I1 and I2. And again, that's looking at junction A. But now if I go and look at junction B, if I think about the current going into that intersection, yeah, we see that the current going in is I1 and I2. But the current coming out, good, be careful, that's I0. Now you go, wait a minute, Greg, you labeled I0 over here. Well, yes, but let's see, there are no places, right? Batteries do not remove charge from the circuit. Right? The purpose of a battery is to maintain a constant difference in electric potential. So it's not removing the charge. And so you could say any charge that exits from junction B must travel through this portion of the circuit and enter junction A. So if we look at the equations that we found using KCL, and applied to junction A and junction B, we see that we have, good, the same equation. We have the same equation written down twice. Okay. And that is a general result, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, however many junctions you have, you can write down KCL one less time. What I mean is if I have three junctions, that means that I can apply KCL twice. Or if I have 10 junctions, you can apply KCL nine times. Okay. And please, there'll be a little bit more nuanced discussion in future classes. Okay. For right now, let's just kind of, we're gonna focus in on that. Okay. And so this is a good bookkeeping maneuver, but you go through, find the number of junctions, and immediately KCL should be applied one less time. So because, and you say, why is that? Why is it that it can only be applied one less time than the number of junctions? Is because the underlying idea pinning KCL is that charge is conserved. And that last junction that kind of the whole system falls on, that last junction will always be written in a manner to ensure that charge is preserved through the entire circuit. Well, now that we have one equation, we turn our attention to applying the voltage law. Right? We said, hey, wait a minute, we have to have three equations and we can excuse me, and we can apply KCL once. That means that we have to do two more equations using the voltage law. Now here, I always think about, just pick a path, pick, a, pick some starting point on a circuit, you know. Okay, starting here. And you are free to choose any path through the circuit to arrive back at the same location, okay? So for example, you could say, hey, I wanna choose this path and I'm gonna go the lower route. So, you know, let me get that in a different color just so that we can see it. Let's do cyan. So the lower route. So I go here and I'll pretend that I travel through this resistor and then, oh, I go through junction B and then I come back and I arrive at the same spot, okay? So I'll go ahead and call that the lower loop, lower. And now we simply go through and we say, when do we experience a jump in electric potential? When do we experience a drop in electric potential? So we remember that the jumps, 
must equal the drops so that the entire thing ends up being zero. So what do we get? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we start walking, we walk, 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 and we see that we go from a high potential side to a low potential side when passing through resistor two. And so I will go ahead and put that on the drop side. And we keep going. We move across the battery, but because of the direction that we're quote unquote walking, you notice that we go from the low potential side to the high potential side. And so that places the battery on the jump side of this equation. And then you notice that we arrive back to the starting point. Now I can see what you're saying, or at least I can imagine. You say, wait a minute, Greg, why did you choose to go clockwise around that loop? Completely arbitrary. You'll notice that if I went counterclockwise around that loop, I would have arrived at the exact same equation. The only difference being that the battery would now be a drop and the resistor would then be a jump. So those two would switch sides, but of course the equation is exactly the same. Well, go ahead, pick a second loop. Go ahead. There's two more that are contained in the circuit. You could say, well, one of them is the outer loop. So I'll start here and I'll go and I'll walk, walk. Instead of going down through resistor two, you can imagine going up through resistor one and walking all the way around through space and then again, ending up at the same spot. Go ahead, write out the equation for that. Good. So I'll call that the outside loop. And here you notice, okay, well, if I decide to go, let's go counterclockwise just for, you know, making it interesting. So let's pretend that we go counterclockwise around that loop. So we get to the battery and we notice that we move from a high potential to a low potential. And so that represents a drop. So I'll put VBAT here. And we keep walking, walk, 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 walk. And then I notice that I move from the low potential side of the resistor to the high potential side. So that represents a jump. So we have VR1. And then I keep going, walk, 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 and back to the original starting spot. Now we notice that we have three equations, each of which contains the unknowns, and we're done. For completeness, I'll say there is one other loop in here. And that generally is the case, is that you end up having more loops within your circuit than uh, what you need, right? Like we only needed two loops to kind of get a system of equations, but there is more than two loops. The third loop is right here in the middle. You could say the loop that contains just the resistors. And if I chose that loop, you'll notice that the potential drop across one of the resistors will equal the potential jump across the other. So that would be a third loop that you can do. Well, why don't we, for sake of argument, go through and solve these three equations to analyze for our circuit? Now, first of all, one of the things that we should definitely do, oops, there it is. One of the things that we should definitely do is go ahead and substitute in the expression for the potential drop across the resistors. So we had here V battery is equal to the potential drop across R2, but we can replace the potential drop across R2 with an expression that involves the current, namely Ohm's law. So we have that V battery is equal to I2 R2. And similarly, we can do that for resistor one. So V battery equals R1 I1. Now, of course, in this simple example, we already know the value of R2. We already know the value of battery. Right, we have nine and two ohms, gives us I2, and we arrive back at the expected result that I2 is 4.5 amps. 
Similarly, if we were doing this one for R1, we had nine volts divided by one is equal to I1 or nine amps. And then having solved for those two currents, we can plug those two results into Kirchhoff's current law to find the current coming from the battery. So in some sense, it feels almost backwards from our combining resistor method for this case, right? The combining resistor method is essentially, we went through and we found the current coming through the battery based on the equivalent resistance. And then we went backwards to a degree to find the individual currents running through the two resistors. Here, basically because of the information we knew, we were able to find the currents running through the resistors and then find the current coming from the battery. Frankly, the order doesn't matter. It's the fact that we found the answer. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so I think we'll leave it there for applying Kirchhoff's laws. Of course, I'll have some more examples. I'll have more involved questions. Uh, the only thing that um, we might skip over, I don't know, maybe we'll do one. Maybe we'll do a more complicated circuit so that you can see the sub and solve process. But uh, really the important part is getting the equations written down and then sub and solve, although I don't want to degrade it and the details are important, that is kind of the math end of things. Once you have the equations, math takes over. And how you do that sub and solve or solution process is completely up to you. There are fast ways to do it, <coughs> linear algebra, and there are slow ways to do it. But the other thing that I'll say is that you'll certainly want to kind of have this algorithmic process embedded in your head to a degree. Okay, I need to find a system of equations using Kirchhoff's current law, using Kirchhoff's voltage law. And frankly, as you apply it, choose the direction of the circuits, label high lows, number of unknowns, then junction rule, then loop rule. As you start applying that, kind of get it embedded in your head because it will start becoming more and more natural and it will prevent you, although it takes longer to draw everything out, it will prevent you from making mistakes when you get your equations written down. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that is plenty of information for this lecture. Keep up the good work. I'll see you next time.